This is Christian Perring, and I'm here to talk about the slideshow on the morality of sexual coercion and seduction. Uh, this is a work in progress, uh, and I may be making additions to it as time goes by. But uh, we're going to be starting off talking about Sarah Connolly's article, Seduction, Rape and Coercion. So the main issue in Sarah Connolly's article is basically how should we think about cases where somebody has sex and they don't really want to or they don't want to but somehow they're convinced into it or they're pressured into it. Uh, the case of rape is quite straightforward in an old-fashioned sense that it was about physical force or the threat of physical force. But now the idea is that we want to expand what counts as rape to include other kinds of coercion. And then the question is, well, what are the other kinds of coercion and what counts as coercion? What's the difference between coercing somebody to have sex and convincing them to have sex? Isn't that an important difference? Uh, this article was published in 2004 in the academic journal Ethics, uh, and Sarah Connolly, uh, who has now retired from the philosophy department, uh, was previously at Bowdoin College, uh, and uh, she has worked quite a lot on issues to do with autonomy and self-determination. To start off this paper, Connolly raises some questions, uh, basically to provoke the reader into thought in discussing what counts as verbal coercion. And she goes through a number of options, which you can see here. Things like uh, threatening to end the relationship unless uh, your partner has sex with you, or saying you're going to find someone else to have sex with, or saying that uh, you'll stop loving uh, the other person if uh, she refuses to have sex, saying everyone does it, calling her names, calling her frigid, making her feel guilty, or even threatening to harm yourself if she doesn't have sex with you. Uh, it doesn't seem like a very sexy thing to do, but that is one of the options that she considers. So the idea is uh, the reader should think about these different cases and consider whether any of them or all of them count as coercion and how think about how bad it is to uh, use those sorts of means of getting sex. Connolly raises the tricky question, is sex as a result of verbal coercion rape? One might, if one was taking a sort of old fashioned view, say, oh, it's not as serious. Uh, it's, we shouldn't call it rape, call it something else if you want. Uh, and in the end, it may even be that Connolly ends up taking something like that old-fashioned view but uh, she you know just basically I, I guess what she's doing here is sort of clearing the space making uh, the options uh, kind of clearer to the reader so she says well maybe it's rape maybe it isn't uh, and it seems to depend on how serious the threat of uh, emotional harm is to the person who says yes or no to the sex but she does uh, say not all emotional harms would lead to lead us to say it is rape uh, she wants to say that uh, sometimes uh, people can voluntarily accept to have sex and also know that emotional harms will result so, as is sort of fairly common in her article, 
things become pretty complicated and it can be a little unclear exactly what her position is. Uh, it takes a fairly careful reading in order to uh, kind of be, work out exactly where she stands. Connolly raises the additional question of how to define rape, which turns out to be quite a difficult question. And it's not actually clear that she gives a definite um, answer to that question, um, but she raises the issues uh, and she draws the distinction between saying sex is simply a sexual act which uh, one person does not consent to, uh, or saying that it's a sexual act where one person uses an element of force or coercion to make the other person engage in sex. And then part of the issue is, well, what's going to count as consent? Uh, if it's uh, simply not saying no, then uh, I guess... Plenty of people don't say no, uh, and so they've consented. Uh, if consent is actually saying yes, then lots of people don't actually say yes when they have sex. Uh, but w many people might argue that uh, you don't have to say yes in order to have sex. Other things will show your willingness. Uh, but if you add the requirement that some element of force or coercion was used, uh, that clarifies it. So again, you know, she's raising uh, the, the issues and showing the landscape. In setting out her, uh, her paper, Conley addresses a couple of legal cases, basically as illustrations of some of the issues she wants to raise. The first one is State v. Lester from 1984, uh, and although you know, it's quite a complicated case, uh, the kind of the most bare facts that are relevant for us are this: that a 15-year-old girl had sex with her father, uh, and the question is was this rape? Was it coercion? Obviously it was statutory rape, but uh, was there kind of coercion or force used in some aggravating way? Uh, so what happened was he asked her for sex and she said no. Then she sensed that he was becoming angry and he asked her again and she said yes. So was her awareness that he was getting angry in itself a form of coercion uh, or did she in some way voluntarily engage in sex? A slightly more clear-cut case is that of Commonwealth v. Mullineridge from 1985, in which a foster parent did make a threat. He uh, threatened to send his foster child back to the detention center if she didn't have sex with him. Uh, so there was no threat of physical force on his part. Uh, I guess uh, maybe the detention center would be, have been in a, a very unpleasant place to be. Uh, certainly she didn't want to go there. She agreed to have sex. Uh, so I guess the question legally was, uh, in addition to this being an abuse of his power, as a foster parent, uh, was this in addition rape? Connolly goes on to discuss uh, a Michigan law which uh, is regarding girls between the ages of 13 and 16. Uh, and the point of the law is to say that there's a sexual assault is worse if there's an aggravating factor of authority over the victim. Uh, and when the actor or the, uh, the person who is charged uses this authority to coerce the victim to submit. So the question is, 
in this uh, sort of case, is it is that only applicable to uh, teenage girls between the ages of 13 and 16? Uh, shouldn't law also recognize that uh, women of ages 17 and older can also be in positions where men can exert authority over them? Uh, this would be uh, teachers, professors, bosses. Uh, so Connolly is asking the question, should that issue of power differentials be extended to all cases? And uh, again, she doesn't actually kind of answer the question, but she raises it. Moving on, precisely from this issue, uh, and building on it, is the question whether we should think of society as a patriarchal. That is, should we see the position of women as one of subjugation? Uh, and certainly some feminist theorists have taken precisely that position, that women are subjugated and are systematically in a position of less power than men. Now, um, if that's true, if uh, women are, if, it, if we basically have a sort of caste system uh, where men are in a higher power than women, then women would be disempowered. Uh, and so it, it might seem just basically impossible for a woman to uh, freely consent to sex. And some have argued that unless a woman is actually kind of uh, very clearly uh, wanting sex for itself out of a sort of uh, sexual desire then it should be counted as rape. Uh, Connolly uh, certainly does not agree with this position. She thinks uh, it's not a productive one or not one that she wants to endorse. She also uh, considers an alternative view uh, that uh, which doesn't endorse this idea of a, a patriarchy or a caste system, but does want to say that women should be just believed uh, for what they feel. And uh, so if a woman feels that she has been violated or that she has been raped, then she has been violated and raped, that her feelings make it so. Uh, Connolly uh, disagrees with that too. She thinks that uh, there can be cases where women's feelings are not uh, kind of guarantees that they are true. Uh, so Connolly wants to uh, move us towards the idea that we need to look at the particular sexual interaction between two people and how uh, one person got the other to have sex. Uh, so the particular conditions of uh, consent or lack of consent in that particular case. One of the basic positions that Connolly seems to endorse is that uh, it is perfectly possible to consent to sex and for it to be perfectly consensual sex even though it's not out of a feeling of lust or sexual desire or something like that. Uh, there can be other reasons to consent to sex. Uh, and she lists uh, a few sorts of reasons. Uh, so in addition to the sexual desire for another person, uh, there would be things like wanting to be emotionally close to your partner, uh, wanting to please the partner, uh, wanting the partner to feel loved, and the, making sure the partner does not feel disappointed. So... Uh, I mean, there, we can also imagine other sorts of reasons which Conley does not consider. Uh, we might think about cases where you, know, you simply make an agreement that uh, you'll agree to have sex with somebody if uh, they will agree to do something for you. Uh, Conley doesn't talk about issues of prostitution at all. Uh, but we might uh, want, want to extend our kind of reflections on the issue to that, uh, where somebody has sex for money. Uh, 
Uh, and uh, we might think about other sorts of reasons that people engage in sex, uh, as a, you know, where uh, sexual desire is fairly low on the list or does not play a big factor. So, to a large extent, summarizing what has gone before, Connolly argues that you know, certainly there can be cases where somebody is ambivalent about having sex. Uh, you know, they are not really very keen to, they don't feel full, full of desire, or they are maybe worried about other things. I think she mentions uh, the worry of getting sexually transmitted diseases. Uh, so there can be a mixture of pros and cons to ha having sex, and the fact that it's complex, uh, that doesn't in itself just uh, tell us whether or not the sex was uh, voluntary or involuntary, coerced or uncoerced, whether it was rape. Uh, so she says, you know, we have to look at this central question, uh, was there coercion uh, in making one person ha have sex? So finally, we start to get to the point in the article by Connolly, where she actually starts giving some answers. Uh, and so, although arguably she does not kind of give a very kind of specific set of guidelines about how to assess uh, sexual activities and sexual interactions where one person is not fully on board uh, still uh, you know she's uh, aiming to kind of give some kind of guide to how to answer that question having got to this stage in her article Connolly uh, explains that she is basing her understanding of coercion largely on that of the philosopher Alan Wertheimer, whose book Coercion was, was published in 1988. Now Connolly's article uh, was published way back uh, in 19, oh, no, sorry, in 2004 uh, in the journal Ethics and uh, it is uh, notable that Wertheimer had a book published in 2003 uh, which was directly relevant to the issues that Connolly is, is discussing. That book was Consent to Sexual Relations. Uh, now, uh, it's likely that Connolly was working on her article and uh, it was probably it was published or uh, submitted to a um, an academic journal uh, around the same time as Wertheimer's uh, 2003 article, so his, his, his book came out. Uh, so it's quite possible that Connolly didn't know uh, about the new book or if she did know about it that she hadn't uh, read it. Uh, but one, one does kind of wonder uh, to what extent her account of sexual coercion actually fits with Wertheimer's account of sexual coercion uh, published around the same time. So that would be uh, an issue for further discussion. So Connolly sets out three main conditions for emotional coercion. Uh, first off, it has to be intentional. The person doing the co coercing has to know that's what, that's what they're doing. They might not use that word, of course, but uh, the idea is uh, they will be pressuring somebody else uh, to have sex uh, in the particular account that Connolly is interested in. I guess there's a sort of question, to what extent should the person doing the, the coercing actually think of what they're doing as a bad thing or a kind of a, a manipulation of another person? Um, 
clearly the person in using uh, kind of threats or telling the other person about the consequences of their refusing to have sex uh, whether when they're doing that is that are they intentionally trying to kind of mess up or twist the other person's mind uh, do they have to think of it as a sort of negative thing uh, and Connolly doesn't really specify anything like that she just says that the action has to be intentional uh, and they have to kind of be explicitly thinking of themselves as manipulating the person in order to get them to have sex uh, then she adds that uh, for something to be coercion basically there has to be no reasonable option or choice left to the person uh, now now that's a little bit um, unclear what reasonable is and how how it is for an option to be open uh, it, uh, it seems that you know in the, in the cases that uh, have been discussed, you know, people who have been coerced into sex have a ver variety of different options. Um, some of them are going to be very unpleasant. You know, maybe, maybe somebody will try and run, but then they might suffer the consequences. Um, so exactly what a reasonable option means is a little bit up in the air there uh, but the basic idea is that in order for coercion to occur there have to be no reasonable options left now uh, in addition to that Connolly also wants to insist that you know that those two conditions by themselves aren't enough uh, the loss of choice must also be illegitimate so the person uh, who is doing the controlling uh, must have must lack a good reason to be doing that so she wants to contrast a, a case of coercion from a legitimate uh, restricting uh, restricting of somebody else so one example she gives is a parent who uh, risked their child's um, internet use in order to get them to do work is that coercive no why isn't it coercive because that's a legitimate use of the parental power it's a reasonable thing to get your child to be doing to be doing their work uh, and uh, i think another example is the state forcing people to uh, pay taxes she says it's not coercive uh, because it's reasonable for a state to threaten uh, in punishment or uh, fines or some other measures against people who don't pay their taxes uh, it can be uh, and that, since that's reasonable then it doesn't count as coercive it's only coercive if the thing that you're making somebody else do is not a reasonable action or at least uh, it's not reasonable it's not legitimate to make them do that uh, so that's an important qualifier uh, and certainly uh, then it raises the question well uh, when is it uh, legitimate to uh, pressure somebody else to have sex so we start to see at this stage where Connolly is headed uh, and uh, almost uh, surprisingly it looks like uh, she's kind of uh, against labeling all sorts of uh, sexual pressures as rape and she is in favor of saying that sometimes people make bad decisions and maybe sometimes uh, the people who push those people into bad decisions are kind of are being mean-spirited or ungenerous or unkind but uh, that is not necessarily a crime uh, so she asks is it reasonable to demand sex in a relationship she's not saying does everybody have to have sex but she says she's saying uh, if people want to have sex and they're in a relationship partly because they want to have sex uh, then that's uh, fine I mean she says obviously there are limits um, 
it can be unreasonable expectations maybe uh, about kind of how much sex or uh, what kind of sex uh, but basically the idea you know the idea of a relationship is to find a compatible partner and if uh, it turns out your partner is not compatible with you then it's fine to say well uh, if you're not going to have sex with me then uh, this isn't a relationship I want um, so uh, she's basically saying kind of those sorts of pressures are perfectly reasonable in a relationship The paper goes on to argue that people sometimes do things that they regret. Now, there's a, these are intentional actions uh, made voluntarily, and people make bad decisions. And in, and in particular, they have sex, which they then uh, decide that was not a good idea. Uh, and in fact, they may even believe it's not a good idea while uh, they are having it and that even when they made the decision uh, they were kind of very ambivalent about it uh, but they agreed to it anyway uh, and she points out that you know uh, generally uh, decisions to have sex are not made under kind of optimal conditions where you sit around and think about it and weigh the pros and cons often they are made uh, in conditions where uh, people are tired and there's emotions going on and hormones and alcohol uh, and so uh, you know, and things uh, happen at a, uh, a pace which uh, outstrips the kind of ability just to think calmly about things so uh, people do end up having regrettable sex Now we get to the part of Conley's paper, which is probably the most debated or disputed. Uh, so she starts talking about uh, an analogy where uh, somebody is not simply just simply just saying to somebody else that if you break, if you don't have sex with me, then I'll break up with you. Uh, rather, they are trying to kind of put pressure on somebody to have sex in uh, in ways of convincing them and they're giving them reasons to have sex uh, and using all sorts of you know not just not laying it out in a they're not laying it out in a kind of calm fashion rather they are using every sort of verbal device they can and so she draws the analogy with a high pressure salesperson she actually says salesman in the paper, but let's go with salesperson. Uh, and the salesperson uses every sales tactic uh, and doesn't give the uh, potential purchaser time to think. Uh, and you know, so you, there, you, there you are in the store, the person is trying to sell you something and uh, not giving you any time to do kind of comparison shopping or check claims uh, it's just a matter of kind of really putting pressure on you to buy I'm a little concerned that uh, a lot of people these days you know, do all their shopping online and so they actually haven't experienced uh, that kind of high pressure salesperson I guess it's uh, there's there is some well, the, the the second uh, second hand car industry has a reputation for having those kinds of salespeople and maybe uh, sellers of electronic goods. I guess uh, another reason that the analogy is not so great is that uh, for a lot of purchases, it turns out that people uh, have the ability to change their mind after the purchase. If they pay with their credit card, they can kind of cancel the purchase and can just return the item. Uh, and quite a lot of states have large 
allow people to change their minds, especially after big purchases. Uh, now, obviously, uh, when you're doing something like deciding to have sex, there is no analogy with the idea of like changing your mind afterwards. Uh, so uh, there are ways, I mean, this, this analogy uh, is not a very strong one. Um, but that may not be relevant to Connolly's main point. Her main point is that uh, you know, even if you have a high pressure salesperson uh, and they put lots of pressure on you to buy the item, that still does not mean that they have robbed you or even coerced you. Uh, one of the things that Conley is very clear about is that you know, those kind of people, they may not be admirable, they may be uh, scumbags even. She doesn't use the word scumbag, but she, uh, the idea is that you know, uh, those kind of pre uh, tactics are definitely not something uh, we admire or want to emulate. But uh, if somebody falls for it, uh, then as that Latin phrase goes, caveat emptor, buyer beware. Uh, and so it's, you know, it's ultimately your responsibility to be skeptical of the claims that people are making to try to sell you stuff. And Connolly is saying there's a kind of an, enough an analogy with deciding to have sex. So if somebody is trying to convince you to have sex with all sorts of a kind of words, then it's up to you to make that decision. They may not be admirable in putting that pressure on you, but that's, uh, that doesn't mean that uh, what they do if they end up having sex is sexual assault or rape. So, Connolly is arguing that there's a category of sexual interactions uh, where one person puts pressure on another to have sex and she's saying that in that for that category it's not rape it's not sexual assault uh, but neither is it just okay we can see it as morally bad we would see those people as uh, mor morally dubious uh, and we would want to dissuade them we would want to chastise them or uh, blame them but uh, it's certainly not a uh, it's not equivalent to rape and uh, probably it's not shouldn't uh, receive the same sort of moral blame as rape does so her main contribution here is to highlight that there is this problematic behavior and she wants to be clear uh, that it exists and that we should be uh, careful in categorizing it. Connolly moves on to a, uh, basically it's the same category but it's just another sort of example of emotional pressure uh, and the basic idea is that well people will you know, uh, ask you to pity them they'll tug on your heartstrings or they'll ridicule you uh, maybe some sorts of peer pressure um, and in order to uh, explain this uh, she brings out her cousin Bo and cousin Flo maybe not her cousins but uh, some sort of story about cousins who are emotionally manipulative. It's an odd part of the paper because um, the idea of an analogy is meant to uh, explain things clearly to the reader and yet uh, this analogy seems unlikely to uh, speak to many readers. So it's a little odd that she would use such an analogy. Uh, and then they're kind of like this bow and flow thing. It's just a little bit, the tone is a bit odd, I would say. But there it is. 
Uh, and so I'll leave you to kind of read that uh, uh, for yourself. But uh, the basic idea seems pretty straightforward that, uh, you know, people, some people are very good at manipulating other people and they will use emotions uh, and kind of appeals to kind of make you feel sorry for them or feel guilty uh, or feel bad about yourself in order uh, for you to have sex with those people. Uh, and um, sometimes it works. Now, again, she's uh, not saying that this is okay. She's saying it's bad. It's bad to manipulate people. But she's also not say she's saying that it's not the same thing as sexual assault. Uh, she thinks it's quite different from sexual assault. And so we should understand those differences. Connolly moves on to the more specific example of persuasion. Uh, and then she refers to the novel called Persuasion, which uh, may well speak to a certain portion of her readership, but uh, is unlikely to really speak to a wide range of readers these days. Uh, it's a little similar to her starting example from the novelist Thomas Hardy from his novel Tess of the Durbervilles. You know, uh, I, I believe I've seen the, a TV adaptation. I don't think I've read the book uh, and uh, probably few of her readers have actually read that book either. So, you know, uh, I mean, in, in interesting uh, style or approach to kind of choose literary examples which won't actually speak to most of her readership. But um, in terms of actually uh, helping to explain what she means or convince readers, uh, one might have thought that a choice of different examples would have been more helpful. Anyway, the uh, the whole idea about uh, persuasion seems now pretty straightforward. Uh, you know, if somebody tries to, pers to persuade you to do something, that's uh, it's your problem to kind of work out whether they are uh, making sense or whether they are just being manipulative. Uh, and uh, negotiating life uh, requires those sky kinds of skills. And if you lack those skills, uh, then that's certainly you're going to be a problem for you. Uh, and obviously, if somebody uh, intentionally kind of uses you uh, because you're not very good at working out what uh, the truth is, and when somebody is bullshitting you, then, uh, well, I guess she doesn't totally say it's just your problem. Uh, she definitely wants to say it's a bad thing for somebody to do to manipulate others, but um, at the same time, you know, she she's definitely making the point that it's uh, important to carefully distinguish those sorts of bad actions from the bad actions of rape. That then is Connie's main point that. Um, we need to be careful about uh, how to think about sexual assault and how to distinguish that from other ways of forcing people to have sex or encouraging them to have sex uh, or manipulating them so that they end up having sex. That is uh, moral kind of groundwork, a clarification. Uh, that will avoid oversimplification uh, and seems ultimately this is her kind of central stance that we need to have a more subtle and complex uh, set of concepts with which to understand problematic sexual behavior.
Connolly ends her paper uh, with an important footnote. Uh, it's not really clear why she sticks this in a footnote rather than putting it in the main text of her paper, except maybe she wants to kind of bury it uh, because she realizes it will be especially controversial and she doesn't want to seek controversy. I mean, and that's maybe true of the whole paper, that in some ways it seems kind of initially that it's going to be another paper condemning the use of women uh, by men. But it ends up being uh, kind of saying that may, yeah, men do bad stuff, but uh, it's not it's not all going to count as rape. And so she's saying this about alcohol too, that uh, when people end up having sex because they uh, have too much to drink, uh, you know, unless it's a real blackout case where somebody is just uh, kind of unconscious, uh, having sex with somebody because when they're drunk is taking advantage of them, but Conley wants to say that doesn't make it rape. Uh, so I guess that would, that's especially controversial because quite a few college campuses have explicitly said that when uh, somebody is inebriated, uh, then they are not capable of making a decision. And therefore, uh, if somebody has sex with that person, then, then it would count as sexual assault. And Connolly is disagreeing with that. She's saying... Uh, on the whole, uh, that is not true. Uh, only in the most extreme cases is that true. Uh, so that's how she ends her paper.